Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, and today I've got a very fun and wide-ranging discussion with my friend Lori Nemitz all about the fascial system. If you've ever wondered about how this can affect potentially movement, pain, and you're just a big anatomy geek like myself, I think you will really enjoy our conversation here. And the podcast today is brought to you by myself, as usual. You can go to MikeTNelson.com, and there you can get on to the newsletter. That's where probably 90% of my content goes out. And there'll be different opt-ins you can use there. We can give you some fun gifts, uh, such as a report on magnesium or even protein. So go to MikeTNelson.com and enroll in the free newsletter for all the latest information. Like I said, that's where the vast majority of my content goes out. Sometimes I republish it on social media, and then yeah, a lot of times I don't. <laughs> so if you want exclusive content, go there. And then today in the podcast, as I said, uh, my friend Lori is here. She's an adjunct professor at Pace University in New York. And she's also an associate professor at the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. She has a really wide background, everything from uh, yoga to dance therapy to much, much more. I originally met her several years ago at a fresh tissue dissection course I did with Tom Myers. You've probably heard of him in regards to the fascial different systems. And the head dissector there was Todd Garcia. So I got to spend a week working on fresh tissue cadaver. And I've done this three times now. And Lori has been one of the great TAs every time. So it was awesome to get her on the podcast here. And she also has a brand new book that is coming out called The Myofascial System in Form and Movement. So we will definitely have a link to it. It just came out, so I haven't had the ability to look at it yet, but I'm sure it's going to be amazing and super interesting. So enjoy this conversation with Lori Nemitz. Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast, and I'm here today with very special guest Lori, who is going to introduce us and talk to us all about fascia. Excellent. Yeah, happy to be with you. Happy to see you again. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know we first initially met at one of the Tom Myers cadaver dissections. God, what was the first time? Was it eight years ago now? Longer than that? I started back assisting, I think about a decade ago. And yeah, I think it was about eight years ago was the first time I saw you in one of those labs. So that was great. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you, for people listening, doing work on cadavers, and then it's also fresh tissue. So for the listeners, most of the work, like when I did my undergrad, we were lucky to get new cadavers every quarter, which for an undergrad program that anyone could enroll in was extremely rare, but they were all what they call fixed tissue, right? So people have heard of embalming fluid or formulin or formaldehyde or whatever words get associated with it. And it was nice because everything stayed in place and it stops all the proteins in space. But when I got to do some work with you and with Tom was really the first time I did anything with fresh tissue. So it still has all the blood and everything in it. And for me, the biggest difference was just the clarity, because when you do fixed tissue, everything just looks the same color. Yeah, you can see muscle structures and stuff better, but I think you lose a lot of the detail and realize how much fat is everywhere. Obviously blood is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Texture of the tissue, how fragile a lot of the tissues actually are. So just, I'm curious how you got into assisting and helping with working in a cadaver lab. Ah, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. I know there's a lot. I just kind of right rambled for a little too long. Uninvolved. We'll get into it all. And fixed versus unfixed tissue and definitely gives a different feel and a different look for people 
what you and what you hinted to you for your listeners is that most of what we see in our modern anatomy books is that fixed tissue. And that's what turns people off. It's that grain, un unpleasant look to the tissue. And when we work with unembalmed tissue, it is definitely much more quote unquote lifelike, but the advantage it has too is that the body is still quite much a thing that people think, okay, bodies, once they're dead, become stiff, and then they're immovable and immobile and all of these things. But that's only a very temporary thing right after death. After that initial period, actually, the body is quite mobile, and we can see that in unfixed tissue. And there's advantages, as you said, to both. If you're working fixed tissue and you're working in a medical class and you have to have your same cadaver form for the whole semester, there's a big advantage to having bacteria being able to be starved away and all of those sorts of things. But the big disadvantage is we lose some of what we can see, particularly things like fascia. Yeah, I, gosh, <laughs> how did I get into all of this? This is an interesting question too. I'll <laughs> touch upon that and then we'll get into even more with cadaver labs because I've been in many different areas. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, too, I go back to, I had been a teacher with Tom Myers as senior faculty for about 10 years, most of the time also in cadaver lab. I'd actually started off first in Gil Headley's lab. For oh, a I forgot of years that part. Before that. The fuzz yeah, guy. <laughs> Some people don't know, but I've been through all different um, types of labs and all. <laughs> And it was Tom's recommendation to go explore with Gil. Hmm. And I also had seen Antonio Stecco early on. Nice. In New York City, I had gone to Mount Sinai. It was called Mount Sinai at the time in New York City, too, for a functional anatomy workshop. I've been to a couple other things, too. Many of those, initially, some of what Gil was working with was fixed tissue. But anytime the trend started to reverse, especially in all the labs that people were interested in fascia for that very reason, because you can see it a lot differently. And interestingly enough, I worked on the Freya project, the plastination project that was done with Body Worlds. And that was to show and highlight fascial tissue but because of the nature of how we have to do the plastination process, that was back to being fixed tissue. So it's an interesting thing of how you unwind what you don't see at any given time. And this has fascinated me as far as history. In fact, in a few days, I'm getting on a plane to go over to Italy, partly to be on a trip to look at art and anatomy, partly research for another project ahead. A little hint about that as well. But because I'm really fascinated at what different points in history did we see certain tissues and what points did we not? Mm. Because words matter, images matter, <laughs> all these things matter, as in movement and all too, what we don't know or get exposed to goes away. So we want to be very rich in our ability to see the body in all of its glory in different forms. And in the same way, too, as far as movement, we want to have that richness in the body, too. If you only look at embalmed tissue, you think the body only works a certain way. <laughs> or likewise, if you only work with different things at different points. So that becomes an important thing that can inform how we then educate ourselves or move or what insights we have into things. So I find that all really fascinating. Yeah. yeah, Lots of stuff there. And for listeners who are probably referring back and yelling at their podcast player now about rigor mortis and crime show investigations <laughs> and whatever, it's for a short period of time. So ATP is used to mm -hmm. reset the actin and myosin connection. So actin and myosin are the little contractile things in the fibers. When ATP, the cellular currency, kind of resets okay. those heads so that it can fire again. So if you die, you don't have any creation of ATP. These actin and myosin heads get stuck together for a period of time, which is called rigor mortis. But that's a on the time frame, that's a relatively short thing. So we're talking about after that point where that's no longer a factor, the bodies are actually quite mobile then at that point. Exactly. 
Or exactly. And the interesting thing too, <laughs> as you've seen too in lab, not only do they become more mobile, but even as we dissect, there's certain layers, the tissue holds a little bit tighter mm -hmm. than other layers. Just by nature of, again, being relaxed, it's almost like being under anesthesia. There's a lot of nervous system patterns that get held in the body that if you saw, again, elderly client, but who's under anesthesia, a shoulder may be wildly much more mobile than it is in life. There's some protection in that as well for people to guard against injury, but sometimes it becomes a habit that's too strong. So not only have we let go of rigor mortis, but we also see an unwinding, probably that takes us back several years from when this particular body had passed into, again, more free movement and form. Because oftentimes, as you see too, beginning of a lab, we're looking at, well, okay, what was range of motion? Where are there restrictions? Where do we think there were surgeries? What is this all about as well? And what are we going to unwind when we get under that surface? So, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned range of motion and anesthesia. So years ago, there was a rumor, which maybe is still going around. It, it seems to me that like fitness and everything related that you have to be in one camp or the other, or you're not with the cool people. So you're either keto or you're for carbs or against carbs or high protein, low protein. And in the movement world, it seems like you've got the very heavy biomechanical centered thing where it's only the tissue that matters. And then you've got the other range, which is, oh, the tissue doesn't do anything without the neurology and it's neurology. That's the super important. And my buddy, Adam Klotzik teaches that it's the neurobiomechanical model. That yeah, it's, that's great. It's both <laughs> of the things, like you can't say it's 100% nervous system. You can't say it's 100% just tissue. And so one of the rumors was that someone under anesthesia would have complete range of motion and everybody could do the splits. But my understanding no, is that that's not, quite not entirely either. true either. Yep. <laughs> like you get more range of motion, but it, it doesn't more. magically fix everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not going to take away everything. And I'm right there with you. It's it's a com combination of different things. And we can hold two different thoughts at once. We don't have to, again, go to one thing or the other. But yeah, I'm right there with you. It doesn't magically mean full range of motion for everybody by any means. Yeah, because yeah, that's what amazed me. Like you, so the thing that still boggles my mind is I've probably told the story before. One of the first times we did the class, we get to the body, we're doing our range of motion testing because at that time, I think it was one of the early classes, we didn't have any history on them. We don't know where these people came mm -hmm. from, know anything about them. So we're writing on the board and doing our range of motion tests and the cadaver we had, her right knee, like I went to bend it, I maybe got 10 degrees and it felt yep. like a very hard stop. And I'm like, okay, so write down range of motion. And so we get that done. And the first step is we start removing some of the skin. So I'm working on the right knee, get most of the skin moved around the knee. And I'm like, I should be a good little scientist. I'll do my little range of motion tests. And I, in my head, I'm like thinking, ah, I'm just going through the, <laughs> to make sure I did all the steps and the knee's not going to move. And her knee goes like almost well past 90 degrees. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh shit. My first thought was, what did I cut? What did I screw up? <laughs> I was like the first day I've already hosed up the cadaver and I'm looking and I'm like, God, I don't think I, I see anything. And so I, I called the main guy who was running the lab over Todd. And I asked him, I said, Hey man, here's what I did. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, that happens. And he just walks away. Yeah, and like, cause to him, he sees this stuff like all, <laughs> and if you've met him, this makes perfect sense. Like it very straight, matter of fact, like super good at what he does, but to him it was like mm -hmm. no big deal. It's hey, yeah. So I like, I grabbed Tom and I said, Hey, what the hell is going on with this? And he's like, we think that maybe there's some restrictions related to how the layer of the skin is interacting with the rest of the anatomy. And at the time I'm still thinking, I don't know, there's something in the knee. There's some particle floating around that just moved or got dislodged or whatever. And a couple of days later, we get to take the entire knee apart. Then it was an older lady, I think in her nineties, the knee looked like perfect. It, there were, you could not, I'm not an orthopedic, but you could not find anything wrong with the knee internally. And that always, again, it's the net of one experiment, et cetera, but it always just stayed with me of the stuff you think. And then you see something like that and you're like, I guess we, the skin isn't super pliable. We have to have some movement within this stack of skin. So it makes sense. So back to your model about the kind of the neurobiomechanics mm -hmm. of stuff too. And 
you don't always find what you would expect to find either. Exactly. And where I think those of us who really are so interested in seeing more, we people are amazed. I've worked now on hundreds and hundreds of cadavers, and there's always something <laughs> that's different I haven't seen before. But we know this in our living friends and colleagues and clients and everything else. There's a lot that goes by the numbers in the book. And then there's a lot that people are creative. Nature is creative. Biology is creative. And sometimes we find something we've never seen before or an un unexplained reason for a restriction that we don't fully have, we can't say for sure. And I think in some ways, the more you get into this sort of work, if you're any good at it, you get more humble and you get more into going, okay, I don't know, but here's again, some guesses in, in what we do. I do that in the movement work I do with people too, or as a professor at the university, I'm think of myself more as a trail guide than absolute whatever. I've hiked a lot of metaphorical mm -hmm. pathway. I can guide somebody, but they've got to do the work. And again, there's always unexpected weather, so to speak, in anything that we do. So it's really interesting. Keeps it fresh. Yeah, and I think that's the hard part looking in. At least I've had more of an appreciation of the variability between one person to the next. Yeah. And you can look in the literature, right? You can find crazy stuff like dextrocardia, where your heart is literally like completely mm. reversed. And in a previous life, I worked for a medical device company. So I got to intend some implants of our devices. We're putting in pacemakers, defibrillators. And I was just observing. I'm standing behind the, the anesthesiologist. And they make a little incision up by the clavicle, up by your collarbone. And they stick a wire in that goes down basically the venous side of the right side of the heart. So they can put the lead, the little wires in there. Okay. And we've I've seen this like hundreds of times. And so I'm sitting there watching and all of a sudden I see the wire go all the way out and then <laughs> straight down into what appears to be the lung, right? Because you're looking on fluoro, fluoro is just a 2D image and everyone in the room just stops. You could hear like a pin drop and I'm standing behind the anesthesiologist and I'm looking at the patient's monitors expecting them to crash and I'm going to get the hell out of the room because the shit's going to hit the fan. The vitals and everything were fine. Yeah. What the? And the physician looks and you can see him puzzling for a sec, looking at the monitor, you see moving the wiring around. And they realize that the patient has is called the persistent left main. They have a weird anomaly in their vessel structure where the vessel's in kind of the wrong spot. And so it's a 2D image. So it was going basically what looked like through the lung, but it wasn't going through the lung. It was still in it the was vessel. Going. <laughs> yeah. But that was freaky. I'm like, oh my, and I asked the anesthesia, I'm like, what the hell is that? And he's like, oh, here's what it is. I'm like, oh my God, I've never heard of that before. And no one knew ahead of time and there was no indication the patient wasn't symptomatic because of that they were symptomatic for a different reason so to me it's always fascinating how similar humans are but yet different and when you're working with someone in person like you don't have imaging like you don't have anything most of the time so you don't know what the exact structure of their hip but they've got some weird thing in their shoulder or whatever like you right. said you're trying to figure it out as you go and it may be that they've, at the end of the day, you've tried a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe they just have some weird structure and that doesn't necessarily work for them. But I think, especially in fitness, you're taught always squat with your feet going this direction. Oh my God, <laughs> your right foot can't be a little bit more externally rotated than your left. And everything has to be like perfectly symmetrical. And at least to me, it just seems like the more work I do, the more you realize how much everything is it's always slightly asymmetrical and sometimes massively asymmetrical. Well, some of our elite athletes too are massively asymmetrical yeah, sometimes because of to their advantage of the sports that they participate in. But sometimes you look at, I mean, some of our elite runners, they don't have the ideal gait pattern and somehow they make it work. So again, we have to sometimes reframe what we think and how we apply that because people are endlessly, like I said, creative to solving problems. So what is the best efficiency for this particular body? And it may not look like what we see for somebody else. So we have to keep that in mind. And you also brought up a really good point too, how we see things again, so matters. If you're looking at 2D imaging, and thank goodness there are people who can read these things really well and look at that, 
But when you're in cadaver lab, you see a three-dimensionality that very few people have that privilege to take a look at. And you start to be able to problem solve a lot better because you think now in a little bit more of a three-dimensional way. Because our atlases are still relatively flat, we do have some of this hol holography and everything else and 3D imaging, but it's a very limited number of specimens at this point. So to be able to actually go into a body and to be able to explore that is really exploring terrain in a very unusual way, but very profound way as well. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings, and I don't know who said it, is that the map is not the terrain, right? The yeah, map is a the representation, territory. or the map is not the territory, right? Mm -hmm. Just a, someone's representation of it. And I think even now with computer simulated software, and you can move stuff around and look at it three-dimensionally, which is 100% a step up from a flat textbook. But I think people underestimate the impact of doing like a cadaver lab with yourself and Tom and everyone else where you get to see it in 3D, but you're interacting with it. You have the proprioception of seeing it and seeing the variety and walking to the neighbor's cadaver and going, holy crap, yours looks different than mine. And <laughs> yeah, look, the heart's in the same place, but to see all the differences and to work with your hands to, th I think you just get a much better again, map of what you're looking at right. because of that proprioceptive interaction with it on top of the visual aspect too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, like I said, I'm playing in, you mean, some other labs these days. I'm actually doing work with K&M Labs, which is with also Leslie Kamenoff, who mm. is part of the Breathing Project. So I'm playing with, and I come from the yoga world as well, that we're playing with applying it to movement. As I mentioned too, I've been in Germany and getting to dissect with an international team of dissectors. And I'll be working to a more specific lab for athletes coming up. So there's mm. more to come in applications. But you said, as you said, anybody's good lab that's out there, if you have, I mean, just a few different comparison points, you're going to see and learn in a really profound way. Those donors are definitely our biggest teachers, and oh, yeah. we respect that in such a huge way. One thing I should always say, too, I think most of your listeners are savvy enough and know this, but that donors now internationally are definitely donors. There used to be a time in anatomical history, we had some kind of iffy sourcing of this, but these are people who wanted other people to learn from their bodies. So they're giving that gift. And I often liken it to looking at a seashell. We're no longer seeing the living creature in it. <laughs> it's the remains of that shell but we can take a lot of guesswork of what happened in that body and in movement and what shaped it in the way that it appears to us on the table. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question I would ask is, I think, so for shape is interesting to me because it appears like you can, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think given enough time and stress, you could probably change almost every tissue because I've seen bony changes, which you know, Wolf's Law, soft tissue, Davis's corollary, yep. that yep. basically any tissue is just responding to the stress on it. And it's fascinating to get an idea of how people were in what positions most of the time. Mm -hmm. How much of that do you think is creatures of habit and deciding to stay in positions versus at some point you have such soft tissue and maybe hard tissue adaptations that you no longer have as much option to get out of that position. Does that question make sense? It's kind of yeah. a chicken or the egg. You've got <laughs> some genetic things that you might be born with. For example, I was born with two holes in my heart and had a atrial septal mm -hmm. defect and a ventricular septal defect. So my heart responded by getting like really big and going into heart failure because of the inefficiency of it. So I think you have some things that you're kind of initially set with, but I think a lot of things, especially in modern society, is a result of not us being aware that we are adapting to our environment and we've adapted to different positions. 
Yeah, I'm a really big advocate in looking into environmental space, how yes. we shape what's around us and how that in turn shapes us. So that goes as far as the buildings that we live in and then work out of. And there's all sorts of interesting things. There's a few architects out there, Columbia, their medical college have one building that I love because it's been done with all of these crazy ramps and oh, wow. um, different surfaces so that people, the medical students, when they're in this tight little space in New York City, have to negotiate some very different terrain mm. within a tight space. I think that's brilliant. Or the way a building can even make you feel as far as sense of space and how you negotiate around other people. I get out on a trail religiously every day, every type of weather. But part of the reason I do it besides being out in nature is, hey, <laughs> that really is restorative, is the different terrain because it's unpredictable. I cover a lot of acreage. I vary my pathway I take every single time. But I would never have the same trail twice anyhow, because one day is humid and damp. One day the rocks have shifted and changed on the steep incline, whatever it is. These things change. And I think we're used to, in modern society, living in very flat terrain places without a lot of challenges or variety. And we know both <laughs> psychologically, body-wise, we need challenges or the body, the first time it faces something that it's not used to is way over challenged. We need that, that in space. If somebody, again, we see a lot of elderly donors at our tables in any lab, you will see that collapsed chest, the rounding again, sometimes the upper elevation of the shoulders is because towards the end of life, it's hard to breathe and this helps that out. But this becomes locked in place. You can kind of see who had walkers and who had wheelchairs mm -hmm. just written in their body because it's been in the tissue for a while. And for whatever reason, wasn't challenged in other ways. Sometimes we, again, get into habit where, okay, that must be the way I am. Therefore, I can't break through that. Like I said, in working elderly clients is really fascinating because of all we can still do and oftentimes doesn't and gets written into the tissues. And the science keeps changing. We know with fascia somewhere around six months to two years, the science, like I said, keeps changing a little bit. Those fascial tissues reshape and reform. Mm -hmm. We know muscle fiber reshapes a whole lot quicker. This is why, again, a lot of athletes doing explosive training without thinking fascially will rupture fascial area, Achilles tendon rupture or what have you. So some of this, yeah, I think it's chicken and the egg. It's hard to say completely. I want to have the most interesting possibilities for myself for as long as possible. And so with that, I look to to vary my movement in different ways. And I think that's, I don't know if that answers fully your question, but one thing I was going to say, I've worked in my past too, I've been a dance movement therapist, I've been <laughs> all sorts of different things along the way, all related. But if you have somebody, for example, with cerebral palsy, that sling of tissue is actually holding them in place. Mm. I see sometimes the mistake that a massage therapist who doesn't have maybe as much training with that population would go in and try to release what's what we would call locked long. And that would be a mistake because that's their structural system. So we have to think about for what body, for what they're dealing with in their life and why certain things have shaped into being. And shape in general, boy, I find this fascinating. It just, that's part of, I mean, what I look at in my book, as far as form, as far as everything else, what kind of what shapes us and why? How do we do this long-term over time and also short-term and into our lifetimes? But I think there's a lot of possibility for shifts and change, but it comes in different levels. It comes from the individual but it also comes from, okay, what environment do you place yourself in? Are you walking somewhere daily? Are you always getting in your car? Are you giving yourself are those choices? Are you in an environment that feels safe? 
to walk. This is a big one too. All of those sorts of things come into play about how we adapt and move our bodies. Really important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The examples I think about related to that is I've had a couple just consults I've done after the fact that they had some knee issue. They had maybe a partially torn ACL. One female athlete had a missing ACL. She's been missing for 12 years, wasn't competitive anymore. And in the one case, she unfortunately went in to have an arthroscopic cleanup. Mm -hmm. And then after the cleanup, the doc said, oh yeah, we found all sorts of heinous shit in there. We cleaned it all up. And she's, <laughs> the doc's showing her the pictures of how good it feels. She's like, oh, wow, this is great. And her knee was a disaster, right? Yeah. She had more pain. It was unstable. And I'm thinking, this has happened a couple of times. And I'm thinking, we have this tendency to make everything look pretty and be symmetric. But in her case, that scar tissue and God knows whatever else in there was probably holding her knee together <laughs> because she was missing a structure. The body's going to try its best attempt to fix mm -hmm. it and add structures into there, whatever that happens to be. So I always think of that as an interesting case. And then the variability, I always think we're becoming like a nation of sea slugs. I'm sure you've probably <laughs> heard the story of the sea slug before. That's this little critter that floats through the ocean. And once it finds a rock, it attaches itself yep. to its rock and then never leaves again. And then it eats its own brain because it doesn't need to move anymore. <laughs> Food just kind of <laughs> flows by. And I just think of even with clients I consult with, it's like, hey, that's cool that you're doing cardio, you're doing strength training, great. But what do you do for recreation? Like you said, do you go hiking? Do you go on a different trail? No, I run the same loop all the time. Yeah. Oh, you've got lateral knee pain on your left side only. Have you ever gone <laughs> the other direction? No, you can't run the other direction. Like <laughs> how much, and these are not like elite level athletes because like we talked about asymmetric athletes, if you're a high level major league baseball pitcher, you're going to be highly you're gonna asymmetric. Be asymmetric. That's yeah. your job in, in life. But I just think of how little recreation we're doing and how even just a simple act of catching a ball. Like the amount of, I always think of if you could train a robot to catch up, like the tasks that we sometimes just take for granted are actually ridiculously difficult. And it just feels like when we're not playing in kind of unfamiliar environments where we know what's coming, but yet we don't. So I think of ball sports like tennis, golf, obviously I do surfing, kiteboarding, that kind of stuff. Like, I think you just, people need to go play in a safe environment, but have some variability that they can't 100% predict all the time. I think we're just wasting some of those precious circuits in our brain. <laughs> I totally agree. And then we'll swing this conversation to yeah. the young kids and play and how, where that all begins. Cause there has been research done too. Robert Lowe did a thing last child in the woods or whatever the name of that book was, but he did research about just aiming from the eighties, how that circle of exploration space for kids has gotten smaller and yeah. smaller. Crazy and small now. you and I know that too, probably from our past childhood. I'm in my fifties these days. You went out and you just played. You were free to explore space. When I grew up initially right outside of Chicago, that was very urban going down in sidewalks, but we were sent outside with the bike and you went off. And then New England, where my family moved to, it was explore, just explore, go out in the woods and explore. And that sort of curiosity, I think curiosity is just such an important thing in life, movement, intellectually, it's all the same. If you lose curiosity, you lose so much. So again, the person who's always running the track the same way, clocking the same exact number of miles because some Fitbit t tells them so. It can be a good incentive, gamification and fitness. And yet, let's have a curiosity about exploring something different, playing differently. Like you said, getting out there, you know, kite surfing, whatever it is, that's unpredictable. And I think it's too part of what I do <laughs> in my recreation is kayak guide. And, and I've done trips around the world kayaking. And that teaches you too to be aware, but there's never a predictable path. Water is very unpredictable. And you've got to be alert to reading 
patterns, which I think is just so fascinating to me. But it also means you have to stay in and responsive to whatever movement gets thrown at your anatomy. So that, yeah, those sorts of things I think are really important. Play is important. And what have we done these days to sports? We have made it so rigorous, so unfun. I look at youth kids programs sometimes. There is not that spontaneous learning or failure. And movement, sometimes we've got to see what works, what doesn't work in order to explore. Al Delcor, too, he was finding out his Viper system was all about looking at the kids who train traditionally in the gym versus the farm kids coming into the ice hockey rink. And the farm kids did so much better than the kids training, partly because why? They have unpredictable load. They have unpredictable vectors, angles of where they're throwing that load. That trains them to be more resilient for, again, passing the puck and doing something that may come at you when you least expect it. Yeah. Yeah. And the most insane part about that too, is that I agree hundred percent with all of that. The hard part is talking to parents. It's a very tough sell. So I don't coach any kids anymore. I couldn't deal with their parents, to be honest. I did it with a very <laughs> short period of time. God, the handful of kids I worked with, they were all great. Worked with the women's yeah. soccer team for a while. They were awesome. Their parents were insane. I'd always <laughs> tell them, which is true. Like the Russians back in the day, like ethics aside, right? They could do whatever they wanted for better or worse, usually for worse. But if you look at a pure performance, that system for better or worse allowed them to try a whole bunch of stuff that they yeah. only gave a crap about performance. And I think with the okay. exception of gymnastics and maybe ice skating, because those are body weight, highly dependent, they found that early specialization didn't even work. Like their athletes would peak super early, but they couldn't compete in the games. So it wasn't right. really worthwhile. So they ended up having them do like aerobic phases, gymnastic phases. They had all these different, what it looks like is just highly variable movement. And that those athletes were later on, they specialized were substantially better. And you even mm -hmm. see that now, like a lot of times good athletes were just good athletes. Michael Jordan, I think played- right baseball in high school. Tiger Woods played multiple sports. So right. the top superstars, I can't even think of a case where maybe Tiger is an exception with golf, but most of them didn't hyper-specialize. So even mm -hmm. from a pure performance standpoint, it breaks down. But yet the simple story of, oh, junior is just got to practice this thing and they do get better. But again, at what cost to win the fifth grade, like little league tournament? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think too, we need people in for life because look at the extremes and then how people are aging end of life. It just, we, there's, I think there's more possibility. And this is where all of this has application. Like how can we make this applicable for our clients and for who we work with and why should we care? All of those good things. But you go inside to go back to lab, you go inside those bodies and it's fascinating. This was something too, I'll throw back to one of the early labs I did with Gil that he always used to say is there's more that's going on in that body on their mm -hmm. very least viable day that they ever had than is wrong. And we tend to look for sometimes those mistakes, but it's interesting to see, okay, what is really going on and how creative we are at coping with it, but what could we do that would be even better? That's where I have curiosity always too. And like I said, curiosity in science and movement, everything I think really carries us far when we go to choreography or to choreography as its point, but I mean that in the sense of we're always doing the same pattern to learn something. To me, that's not learning. We're, we're not exploring in a really thoughtful, creative way. Creativity, making some mistakes, it's all part of it. <laughs> yeah. Part of being human. <laughs> Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I like kite surfing, not only because it's fun, but it's one of those skills that's harder 
to learn. Like I imagine surfing, mm-hmm. I've only gone surfing a couple of times just without a kite, but it's one of those things where there's no free lunch. Nobody comes in day one and has it mastered. It's just too right. complicated. I'm sure golf is the same way, a high level dance, like anything that's mm-hmm. at a high level, it's going to take you years and years of yeah. practice, but you can get better. And I just get nervous sometimes about society that people don't want to try. So even training clients, right. like I've had, I've lost count of how many clients so I'm like, okay, you've never really done a squat before. Let's have you do a goblet squat. Here's what it looks like. Do a rep. And they're like, oh, this is so horrible. I can't do this. <laughs> I'm like, how many times in your life have you ever done this exercise? They're like, never. Okay. You've never done right. this before. Like, why do you think you would be amazing at it? The first rep is always your worst. But I think as a society, we're moving away from, it's not safe to quote unquote fail or look bad or just there seems to be a thing of trying to skip part of the learning process and you can do things to accelerate it but you have to make mistakes that's just that's how you learn like you can watch tons of video but when you try it it's probably not going to look very good and yeah some people are better at that than other people i don't know i just get nervous because it seems like it's not a good thing to make mistakes and making mistakes is just part of the learning process and there's no way around it. Yeah, absolutely. And my biggest area that I teach these days is actually at a university. I teach at Pace University as well as guest at Rush Medical, but I teach university age students. And when I teach both anatomy and movement, when I teach my yoga only courses, for example, I turn them around. I don't let them face the mirror. I don't let them have their cell phone out. Don't let them do any of that because I want them to be comfortable not having to watch or be watched and by but by anybody but me but to be able to be okay making mistakes you have to learn how to fall safely if you're doing arm balance mm-hmm. something like that but there's there's nothing wrong with not doing things perfectly. That's why we call these things practice. And we've so pulled away from that, I think partly because we're always on social media where there's filters and people can fix things and take the best frame or the best couple seconds of performance and have done it over and over again. But what most people don't see is those behind the scene things. And that's what's fascinating to me. How do you learn? that's interesting. I don't really care about the final look of something as much as does somebody have the ability to learn and change and get, again, curious. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we lose perspective on how long it takes even high level athletes or performers to do what they actually do. Like it was Alex Honnell spent what do you spend like a year and a half to do that practicing the climb that he did yeah. kind of see like the <laughs> final thing. And it's crazy. It's just bonkers. I'm afraid of heights. I get, my palms are sweaty just talking about it. Right. <laughs> so it's absolutely bonkers and insane, but to him, it wasn't a big deal because he had practiced it so much that he knew he could do it. Granted you're, you're just right. no safety there. So you have to do that, but we don't see all the time that goes in or like I think of some of the Red Bull videos like Danny McCatskill has done with crazy stuff on a mountain bike. And it's pretty cool. A lot yeah. of times at the end, they'll do the little blooper reel yep, and they'll show exactly. him doing the same trick over and over to how many times he just fails doing it. <laughs> but you watch the whole like one trick after the other and you realize like sometimes those are done in a session, but a lot of times those are just pieced together. So right. he'll work on one thing, get that down, maybe try to add something else. But the goal isn't to do it as one flow as a competition. It's to create a a piece of video, a piece of art. So it's nice at the end to see all the failures that went into it so that we don't leave with just this image of, wow, he just did that in an afternoon. It's like, he was working on that for probably a year, probably almost a decade for some of the other skills, the prerequisite to be able to do that. Uh, But again, we don't see that a lot of times. Absolutely. I think that's really important. Yeah. And some of the, especially the rock climbing, I'm right there with you, but (laughs) my younger son's a rock climber, but um, it's, it's fascinating because it is, it's the, it's practice with anything, whether you're again, piano player, you're golfing, whatever it is, there is that high level at the top failed a lot to get there. (laughs) And, but with each, again, there was a learning process and there was also 
the ability to, again, play in different areas of the body and to be more resilient to it. Parkour is fascinating for oh, that yeah. reason, too. And you see their fails. <laughs> There's some life and death almost fails. But as far as, I mean, talking myofascial bodies, what they learn to do is actually roll to take the impact of everything and to be loose to be able to let that distribute throughout the whole body instead of tightening which is our response and most of the time to fear which tends to of course shatter risks everything else when people freeze something they're doing in nursing homes now is teaching some of the elderly patients how to fall safely yes and to do that sort of thing of rolling not parkour level <laughs> per se, yeah. but it's based on that same idea of how do we, how do we explore these things? How do we learn to, how do we learn to fall? Modern dance, which I came out of that whole world, many modern dance classes, half your classes based on fall and falling and learning how to roll out of that and how to recover from that and do it safely. You get knocked up a little bit to get into that point, but you learn how to play with all of these different things. goes back to play again. Yeah. yeah and if, if you're better at that skill set of falling, your odds of tensing up before it happens are going to be a lot less. But again, it's a weird thing that people don't think of practicing either. It, I think it's gotten better, but to me for a while, it seemed like the teaching falling was almost like a high level martial arts. Like some of the stuff I saw years mm. ago, it didn't take into account like what your innate reflexes would be. It's okay, right. do this advanced parkour thing where your arms all the way out here and you're rolling all the way up on your shoulder. And I'm like, yeah, for those athletes, that makes sense with hundreds to thousands of reps. But a buddy of mine taught something that was more simple, which was yeah, put your hands in front of your face, but then use that to distribute your load Yeah, because the amount of reps it's going to take you not to do those hardwired reflex things is crazy. So just do the hardwired reflex thing, but modify it so that you're not as stiff, you're dissipating more force not try to rewire how your body is reflexively wired either. And that's where learning, why are we acting some of the way, how have we been shaped over our evolution is really important. Because as we know, front of the body, more fast twitch fibers, we're protecting this really vulnerable area that all our quadruped friends <laughs> tuck <laughs> underneath themselves. Makes a lot of sense, but we're upright, we're bipedal it's a really weird place to be in an evolutionary sense. So we have a lot of challenges coming on upright and to understand that in terms of anatomy, understand why, again, both fear, stress, all of these things pull us forwards, the head forwards. It makes, the more we learn about all this, then we can start to intelligently work with that and recognize it. We don't recognize, we can't really change. <clears throat> and I think that's so important, like I said, in any part of dealing with the body in any shape or form. Yeah. Related to that with the fitness stuff for you, do you program a lot of extension or the opposite of flexion because people are in this sort of flexion working at the keyboard I and mean, hell i'm probably sitting in that position <laughs> yeah, right, too right now. now do you try to program the opposite of that to try to get some sort of semblance of balance or to try to keep them out of that as much because it seems like the more you get closer and closer into permanent flexion like you're getting closer to death yeah, and that's a really good question. Because I came out of the world where I was trained in Laban movement analysis and Bartinioff fundamentals and some of this thing that comes out of both crisscrossing with dance and movement therapy worlds, we also look at things of you can't go immediately usually from one extreme to the other if the pattern is really tight in there. So to have somebody who's pulled in like this and go, hey, do a back bend. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be not happening. And yet we do have to counteract. Why would we, again, keep doing chair pose and yoga when most people are in chair pose literally every day? Right. 
So I do look to counter that, but to soften it. Again, if somebody has sciatic nerve issues and everything else, we're not taking them right away to some other extreme, but I'm looking, okay, where is there space for that nerve for whatever reason that's getting compressed? So I'll look oftentimes for that mid-level intermediate point and then start to move into that, but not to go right away from one extreme to the other. However, if you have somebody who is much more movement savvy and who has that in their body system to go through that a little bit quicker, then, I mean, for my own practice, I go, I've been sitting a lot. I've been teaching a lot. I've been actually running a lot. This way, I do need to get myself into something a little bit more opposite, but I have a lot more play with that normally. So it depends, but I wouldn't go opposite, opposite, which is where you see that happen in a lot of sports, as well as yoga, as well as anything else. People just go right away for the extreme or weight bearing when most of our people don't weight bear like on their hands during a normal work week. And then suddenly the first thing you do is a downward facing dog. That's rough if somebody hasn't been playing with that. So I always look for getting there, but not from one extreme to the other. There's a pathway that you have to play with. Yeah. Yeah. The phrase I think of is my buddy, Adam Glass said this, and it applies to programming and movement. And he just said, just move where you can. Yeah. So I'm always thinking with the client or with the person, what movement can they do that might be adjacent to what we're trying to go away from. It's probably not the end goal because we can't get them to do the end goal right away or they probably would have figured it out on their own anyway. Can we get them closer to that path? And then over time, the adaptation to closer, closer, and closer. But again, in fitness, that doesn't sell. It's learn how to do 100 (laughs) pushups a day or whatever the extreme thing is or couch to 5K. And there's some good programs with that kind of stuff, obviously. But yeah, when you talk about the resilient part too, it always mystifies me and it's just amazing how, yes, you can have injuries that happen to the body. And yes, we tend to focus on all the stuff that's quote unquote wrong, but most of the stuff is correct. And the fact that mm-hmm. the body will perform as well as it does in the face of all the other things that we do to it just boggles my mind. If I yeah. wasn't putting sugar in the gas tank of my car, I probably wouldn't make it around the block. You can have people <laughs> who eat just a horrible nutrition for years, decades on end. You can have people who don't do a lot of movement and they're not in the best shape, but they're still upright. They could still do yeah. some stuff. To me, it's just amazing on both ends of the spectrum, how much abuse the body can take and still keep going versus the elite athletes were sometimes those small, tiny things at that level do make a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's exploring all of that. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> I can't add to that. That's well done. <laughs> so we're about an hour into the conversation now, but I'll finally ask you like, well, how would you describe what is fascia, right? So that might be a new, we're talking about movement and just different movement philosophies, but in terms of fascia, that may be a new word for people or they might've heard of it. Like, how would you define what fascia is? In the first place, I do let people know the definition keeps changing. And that surprises people right off the bat because it's a dissectable aggregate of these. There's very scientific definitions. In basic terms, we have this restaurant mixture of different things, the fibers, the collagen fibers that are in there, the water, the glycoaminoglycans, the slidey glidey things, they putting all of these different things together and having the different combinations make up different parts. Because when we parse it into that thing, we go, okay, so that's how I can understand adipose being part of this fascia as well, as well as again, intermuscular septums, those white areas around the the muscles, but also what intertwines. The reason why the orange image gets used so much is because basically the white of any oranges is cellulose, is the fruit fascia. So it's a very easy way to start to dive into that. And because I am a dissector, I was little, not only peeled apart the individual segments, intermuscular septums, 
I also did the individual wrappings, sometimes around those teeny oh, nice. tiny segments, which is like the fascia that wraps around any muscle, individual fibers on a very small level. So when we start to describe that, then we can say to a client, okay, the reality, of course, of the orange is the whole. You don't see any of this separation until I peel it. But why does it peel easier in certain ways? Where it peels easier is where the fascia often is. Sometimes it's used for strapping too, but think about it right underneath the skin, that white area is much more mobile. That's where there's some movement. Again, I peel easily. I separate between those segments, between the intermuscular septum. That's a good thing. And if I want to eat an orange slice, if, I, if I'm moving, I want to have some ability to slide and glide between those fascial septums or I'm going to get stuck. If my hamstrings are glued together as one group and I can't mobilize that, I have less possibility in my movement. Or if my quadriceps, if only the rectus femoris is really active, but nothing else is working and nothing else is sliding and gliding, that's going to restrict me as well. So we start to sometimes use this imagery into it and why we're also, a lot of us are creating more images to share with the world in different ways, like the project that was the Plastination Project, just to have people starting to think about these things in new ways. As I mentioned, as part of that international group, the Fashionet Plastination Project group, and when we were done with this whole thing, it's permanently, it was in Montreal for, again, mm. the Fascia Research Congress, but its permanent home is in Berlin. And the first oh, okay. time I visited in Berlin, it's set in a lovely room, really with a lot of different explanations, educational explanations around it. But it was watching people's reactions come into that room mm. and go, wait a second, what is this? I've seen muscle person, mm -hmm. circulatory person. I've seen the skeletal system. But what the heck is this other rep representation of the body all about? And to start to think about this in that holistic way is really interesting. And then to go again, what shapes us into different forms within that? How do we play with that? How do we keep it healthy? What's some of the latest research on all of that? There's a lot going into nutrition, which I know is a big love of yours as far as, is again, how can we keep that fascia healthy and viable? So, yeah. Why do you think fascia appeared to be bypassed for many years, which just from my own aspect, my bias is, I think when you look at embalmed tissue a lot, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, you just don't really see it. And I remember when I took anatomy and physiology the first mm -hmm. time, and all honesty, yeah, I wanted to learn it. I thought it was super cool. I got to work on cadavers. It was great. But I was also hyper worried about trying to pass the class. So passing the class involved, identify the origin, tell me the insertion, pokey things in the <laughs> tissue, tell me what that is. So it almost seems like if you've ever seen the old, uh, you can look it up on YouTube, it's called awareness drill, where mm. the guys are passing the basketball back and forth. Yes. And I'll give it away for people who are listening, but there's this gorilla and a guy in a gorilla suit goes right yep. through the middle of them. I've seen that. And you ask people this who've never seen this video before. And I think it's like how many times does the person in the black jersey pass it to someone in the white jersey or something like that? And you ask them at the end, did you see anything else in the video? Everyone's like, no, Are, nothing weird, nothing else. No. <laughs> and then they're finally like, did you see a guy in a gorilla suit go through the video? You're like, what? There's no guy in a gorilla suit. And then as soon as you mentioned, you watch it again, you're like, holy shit, there's a guy. There in a it is. Suit. Yep, there he <laughs> is. Yeah. And I think you hit upon something I really love to talk about. I put it in the beginning of my book as well. I've written about it for some different talks too. What we're not aware of, what we don't name, we lose our ability to see. 100%. And there is this wonderful children's book called The Lost Words, mm. which was done a couple of years back. And it was done because the Oxford Dictionary was taking out really common words like dandelion, all these different what? things. 
Yeah, because they were like, kids don't need to know that one anymore. Oh, and Jesus. the <laughs> authors of this book, yeah, we had the same reaction. They're like, we need to make a book and with beautiful illustrations to make sure people hold on to these words, to these things, to know about them, because what we have out of our vision, we lose. Mm -hmm. And there's many other writers and other thinkers who've thought along these lines. Foch is an interesting one historically in here, too, because people like Bougerie and Jacobs did a beautiful atlas a couple mm. centuries ago that had these big pictures with the fascial septums very mm. clearly shown, the muscle fiber taken out. It gave inspiration again to some of what was done at the Fascia Plastination Project. So it's been there before. That was unembalmed tissue. Now, there were times during unembalmed tissue for practical reasons, you'd want to get off that adipose layer quickly and efficiently because, again, you didn't have refrigeration. You didn't have necessarily time on your hands to work with tissue in a way that made sense to close up at the end of the day. As most unembalmed tissue labs are about five days, because that's about what we can handle with bacteria coming in its nature. And that's um, with refrigeration and modern technology. At yeah, night. it does help. It helps delay yeah. that process. <laughs> Once that scalpel comes in, we're fighting this battle with air and bacteria and everything else that's meant to happen. As far as that, you're right spot on. Embalmed tissue then... We were also looking at scraping away everything and just looking at muscles, which were considered to be important. Even Vesalius, who many of us love in the mm -hmm. fossil world, a lot of very lean bodies, partly because he's working with criminals that were the body, not so readily donors, but were the yeah. ones he was working <laughs> with. X. So you didn't <laughs> see a lot of that fascial layering that was taken away. So there's also that. And then, as you said, the medical model became very clear on, we've got to name it. We're going to put these little things in place and we're going to have this scraped away. And Netter, you mean for all his artistic brilliance to have both things going there, took away a lot of the fascia. We didn't see it. If you don't learn it, I mean, in your children's book, if you don't see it in your anatomy atlas, you don't think that, think about it. So it's a shock and a revelation, like you mean in the plastinated model for people to go, wait a second, what the heck is this? I don't know what the name is and why does it keep connecting? As I mentioned, I've guested at Rush Medical and they were loving that I was doing uninvolved tissue and I had oh, a lot cool. of the surgeons and everybody else come in and look at what I was dissecting as a project because they were like this is great this is what we see in surgery but not what we usually see in the table in balm tissue so it is an interesting thing that shifted and changed of course if you're teaching again over a semester having that embalmed tissue makes a lot of sense and yet there's real big value in seeing this unembalmed and being able, especially for movement people, we really want to see that and get those connections and understanding. It's a different map. And I guess I can say that in clear terms, we're looking at any anatomy atlas, any system of thought, even myofascial connections are maps. And this is this has become a big thing, hot thing in the whole <laughs> world on social media. Dare I like have people come after me on this one? But people get, like you said in the very beginning, it's a similar thing. People are in one camp or the other. And I go, both can exist. This is more physics. Both can exist at the mm -hmm. same time. And can we hold that thought? Because even any models of connection are useful if they make sense in their connectivity. And we're oftentimes looking at connections that have made sense or replicated, but there's still a model, there's still a roadmap. But I sure, I want a roadmap if I'm going down to a new client oh, yeah. who I've never met before. I definitely want the GPS to take me and tell me where I'm going because otherwise it's, okay, I'm going to guess it's the 18th street over the, what, you know, it's another map. 
It's not all of reality, but it can be a useful way to parse it out. It's another construct. When we eliminate any ability to see other maps, other ways of seeing, we lose something. So I'm always curious to look at all of these things <laughs> and to learn it all. And if I'm talking with somebody else where I want to have those specific names, I want those names so that I can have a conversation and then expand it into, hey, but look at this. This is a cool connection or a way of seeing you might not have thought of before. There's a relevance here for something else. So I think that's why with my book, too, I like conversations between people. And sometimes to have a really meaningful conversation, you've got to learn language <laughs> and then be ready to change languages or hear a new language for yourself. And I think fashion is that for some people. It's a different language than they've spoken before. It's also, interestingly, and you know this as well too, almost becoming a catchword and too much the buzzword where it oh, just yeah. gets thrown out there in any shape or form. Gotta train your it fashion, must be bro. Fashion. Everything must be fashion. <laughs> and it's that's the most important thing. And I'm like, wait a second, I love it. It's not everything. Nothing is everything. Just to have that caveat in there too. Yeah. I'm trying to think of did Da Vinci ever show any fashion stuff? He had. I can only think of a couple that he yeah, might have, but I'm fuzzy on it to be connections, honest. Connections, which are actually the arms in particular, mm. kind of show some of these connections a lot more fluidly than other people did. We do think he did probably in the neighborhood of 30 dissections hmm. during his lifetime, but it wasn't, there were things he got wrong. Yeah. The one that everybody thinks of is again, female anatomy, because again, when he showed the uterus and some of what came off of it, that was really bovine anatomy, hmm. female anatomy and the shape and size were wrong, but he was piercing, piecing together best he could from different things he saw. But a lot of it is fairly accurate, but just still in that tradition, it was a lot of it was cleaned off of at least the superficial fascial layers. Still... Not as much of that as Bougerie and Jacobs did, or as we see in some other early anatomy that was showing some of those more myofascial connections. Yeah, things stuff. What are your thoughts about teaching origin and insertion? Which I know sounds like a very <laughs> simple question. I've talked to Tom at length, probably ad nauseum and boring him <laughs> with this question. But for me, when I took anatomy and physiology at first, right? So you always learn origin and insertion. That's the way it's classically taught. And I think there's a time and a place for it. I'm not saying I'll throw that out entirely. But I realized once I got to doing fresh tissue and looking more at it as a systems point of view, again, like you don't see what you don't see. I was so hyper-focused on always looking at origin and insertion that I missed other stuff that was very obvious. So in my example... I took a class, a PRI from Ron Horasco, who was teaching it. So Postural Restoration Institute. And Ron's, yeah, did you know, like the other end of the psoas is actually the lumbar spine? And I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah, it splits there. And he's, and then it disappears into your diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Your diaphragm. What? I didn't learn that in anatomy and physiology. You're full of crap. What is this? And I talked to him even after class. He's like, oh, we did it in dissection. I'm like, how did I miss this? So I go to look at the anatomy books I had growing up. And in a couple of them, you can see the area where it goes to the diaphragm and it was indeed cut off, right? So it was not necessarily that the picture was inaccurate or wrong. It was just hyper-focused on origin and insertion. And obviously Tom's got some great pictures of this and things too. And so I have this love-hate sort of relationship with it because I taught anatomy and physiology. And the second time I taught it, I feel bad for all those poor students because <laughs> it was a 300 level class and I was trying to ride the line of, yes, you must know origin insertion. Yes, you must know basics, but don't let that just define everything that you're ever going to look at again. And I think they just looked at me like a two-headed space alien because it didn't have a cadaver portion. It was an online thing. It was a weird setup to begin with. 
Yeah, no, and that's a really good point. The psoas diaphragm, the diaphragm, the legs of the diaphragm definitely interdigitates so beautifully in a lot of the cadavers that we've seen over and over. What's interesting is there are some historical precedents for that, but they're not usually in the clinical anatomy atlas. I couldn't find them in the clinical anatomy book. As I went, it bugged the shit out of me. And I went back and looked and I couldn't find it. Gar Bartinioff, who was, again, physical therapist. She worked with people like Lomax, who is most well known for the Smithsonian Folkway recordings. She was also somebody who was highly interested in just movement, in environment, in all of these different things. And she has a lovely illustration in her book that basically is very similar to Tom Meyer's looking illustration, which shows, again, the diaphragm going right into the psoas and being a continuity. And hey, doesn't this make sense for a lot of our deep movement that we're doing? So that's, yeah, that's a really clear one. Another one I've seen a lot in anatomy labs is when you take the serratus anterior to rhomboids, mm. which no traditional anatomy book will have that. They have a hard ending. Yep. And yet, if I turn my scalpel around, it is very easy to make that continuity, which does make a lot of sense to me when I'm playing with something like a chaturanga in yoga or a traditional push-up and playing with somebody who has, again, wing scapula. How do we stabilize it? Could we stabilize it from serratus anterior? Again, I think it's that curiosity to stay open. It's still, it's a tricky place to be. I'm lucky I came into anatomy sideways, <laughs> go back, learn some more traditional anatomy, then came back again. I already had a little bit of that open mind, but it's a little bit like, again, learning your scales on the piano. You sometimes have to learn that to then improvise, like I said, to have the conversation. You know, again, we origin insertion, does the body really care about it? Not whatsoever. <laughs> and right. Some of it isn't so accurate. But it is a good way. It's a concept again. So where is it useful? Where is it not? Where does it cripple you? I think that's the key in any of these things is when you get absolute about anything, <laughs> you got to go stay open and go, okay, that's a good thought process. But what what is viable about it? What's a good idea? What is not maybe scientifically able to be reproduced and those sorts of things too. Yeah, I, it's not, I'd say, throw it out completely, but we do spend a lot of time learning origin insertions when it may not be necessary. So who are you learning this for? What's your reason? Why? You know, that's where if I'm changing things or learning about nerve mapping and I have to deal with that in a different way, there's some interesting things there traditional anatomy, we do a lot of this. But again, for some of your recreational people, do we need to know those certain things like where biceps or origin insertion? That in the gyms, but you don't see necessarily much more holistic look at the body. Yeah. Yeah. I've even I, recommended- I have an answer for you completely. No, no that's good. <laughs> I've even recommended people to take like the course you helped Tom with and anything with fresh tissue dissection to a lot of people who've never taken anatomy, who work as trainers, most of them, but don't have much of an anatomy background. And they always look at me like I'm just out of my tree. And I'm, they're like, but I'm not going to understand anything. This is going to be so crazy. I need to go back to college and take anatomy physiology 101. And I'm like, you can, I think it's helpful. But I, if I were to redo my education again, I would go the inverse. Like yeah. I would take a one or two week fresh tissue dissection. Yes you're going to be overwhelmed. Yes, you are not going to remember all of it. Christ, I don't remember half of it now. I'm horrible for teaching anatomy and physiology. But I remember the pictures. And I remember what it looks like. And I can go back and refresh my memory for origin and insertion because I've stored the mental map of what it was. Even though I may have forgotten some of it, I can still remember a lot of the differences and the nuances and that type of thing. Even though I may not be able to name some of it, but I could go back to a 2D picture and pick that up because I've had exposures on both ends. So my advice yeah. was just go do it. Yes, you're going to be overwhelmed. But I think starting with a more 
accurate mental picture, even though you could spend the rest of your life studying it, I think is better than going from a 2D because I feel like I had to go back and unlearn a lot of stuff that was helpful as a foundation, but yet I think limited me from seeing as much as I could on the first dissection to the second to the, the third. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's having that just mind open to it and to see what is actually, you oftentimes learn a lot more. There's oftentimes been, it's a sculptor, it's a engineer, it's a whatever, mm -hmm. becoming sideways into this that actually sometimes has either the better skill set for dissection or you mean can conceptualize it really accurately because they don't have all the mumble jumble of what it should be in their mind's eye. They're really open to just seeing what they see. And you may remember too, years back, there was the book Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain that came mm -hmm. and it was mixing up things and turning a picture upside down. So you just actually looked at the picture to draw it instead of going, oh, this must be a finger. This must be an ear that I got to draw it what I think it looks like. You throw all that away and you just are looking at shape, at form. And that's beginner's mind in some ways. Mm. Not, and here we go back, we're bringing this whole conversation <laughs> together, but you're not afraid to fail. Yeah. And hey, that's where the real learning happens when you can make mistakes. Oftentimes too, I have people who are like, oh no, I messed up. Like Amy New said before in the beginning, and it's no, what did you learn from this? No, yeah. oh, that was really tough to cut through or wow, that was much easier than I thought. Okay, why was that? And we can start to have a curiosity about what we're experiencing, what we're seeing. And again, I like to guide people through an intelligent way of going about this, but there's always learning. No matter what you do, if you keep that openness, that curiosity to it. So I just, that's what I think is also so exciting, so interesting about all of this work. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was also refreshing to do it because the first time I took the class, I don't know if it was my wife or someone was asking me, they're like, why the hell are you taking this class? I'm like, because <laughs> you get to work on fresh tissue. This is going to be so amazing. I've never worked on fresh tissue before. I've never done my own pro sections where I'm doing the dissection in a certain uh -huh. area. And they're like, what are you going to learn from it? I'm like, I have no idea, but I know I'm going to learn a shit ton of stuff. I don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah. I just know I haven't had that experience before. So by definition, I know I'm going to learn a bunch of stuff. It'll be totally worth it, which it was. But it's also refreshing to go in with, okay, I don't have to memorize all the origin insertion. Like luckily at that point, I went, I'm probably never going to teach anatomy and physiology again. So if I don't, I'm not going to chastise myself because I couldn't remember everything I saw that day, the origin and the insertion, where the nerve was, all this other stuff. Just be open-minded to what do you see, what's in front of you, what can you learn from it? And yep. I ended up, I don't know, I think I'm taking like 15 pages of notes over the course of a week or something like that. But it was all stuff, there's no way I could have predicted what it was going to be before I had the experience, which is right, very, I right. think, useful. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. And like I said, the visualization, the tactile feel of it, all of that is so important in really understanding. I got fascinated for a number of years in the brachial plexus, and mm. I would go through a brachial plexus dissection just in between things. <laughs> teaching. And, and you're off time. I though. care about the names and I'd name them afterwards. Yeah. But I more cared about visually following the pathways. And then having the curiosity afterwards of going, okay, now I can name it. Oh, wait a second. This particular body doesn't <laughs> quite match or wow. How many of these do match the map? What's that all about? And why, why would that work that way? So like I said, I think the biggest thing is just to stay curious, <laughs> stay curious in all of this. And it takes you, takes you far for sure. Yeah. Related to doing hands-on work, I don't know, do you do hands-on work on people for massage or body I, position actually, or whatever word you yes. want to associate with it, massage therapy? I don't know. Everyone uses their own word for it. Yeah, actually, I fully say that's one thing I 
don't do. <laughs> oh, okay. You can do everything <laughs> else. Actually, I thought, oh, she probably does this too. I know. <laughs> I was kind of an oddity coming through as faculty when I did for Tom. I think I was the only one who, who went through without being a structural integrator. Mm -hmm. And my hat's off, my respect to all of those people, but I, and I <laughs> get manual work done on myself, but that is one thing I never put into my toolbox. I had a lot of <laughs> interest in other <laughs> things going on and and moving and everything else and art and every other area. That's one thing I actually don't do in my own work. I stay as a person, movement expert, movement therapist, going on the psychological end, university work and all of that. And uh, yeah, and dissector. But uh, that's the most manual I get, which I get from I would say my art background much more than hmm. anything else. I think it was really good. I was an art historian way long time ago, oh, okay. along with movement work, because it did teach me how to look at things. Mm. So even in my book too, I talk about that one point too, of looking at the body too, it, like an art historian, you look at relationship between things. You don't look at these absolute grids. You look at balance, relatively speaking, between things. You look at how is it moving? How is it going about? Those sorts of things as well. And that gave me skill set for dissection because I, I think to a good dissection, there is a craft technique to it to make it a lot of that hands hats off to what I learned from Todd Garcia too because that painting with the scalpel mm -hmm. is really pretty accurate that you want to be able to reveal what you want to reveal but it doesn't have to look exactly the same as the last dissection you did in that area and that's what becomes also interesting it has to be it can't just be all over the place that would be, first of all, disrespectful of our donors, yeah. but it also, what do we want to show? What do we want to reveal? For a long time, I, I love doing very layered dissections, the encyclopedia pages, and yeah, then put yeah. it all back together, <laughs> and it came back together at the end of the evening. And that still fascinates me and has value. But then I started wanting to look in different directions, different ways too. And I think you learn a lot by taking it into different areas. Like some of the dissections we're doing now, with the K&M labs, we're focused a lot on the diaphragm, speaking of. Mm -hmm. I've gotten into looking, okay, how can we creatively look at different viewpoints of that from different ways? And what can we learn by doing a very unusual dissection to get to that point? And what connections do we see? What do we lose? All of those sorts of things. Because you gain something every time you have a slightly different, like you said, almost like snapshot in your memory bank of something that you've seen, you, you put that in and start to learn something else from it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we forget that humans think visually, right? So yeah. we store things visually. If, I've used this before in the podcast, but I'm like, how tall are the windows in your living room? No one has that stored like a computer. They imagine themselves standing in their living room. They're about whatever height. They're like, oh, it's about you know, like five feet or whatever. They have the visual memorized so that they can answer almost any question or speculate about any question related to it. Don't think of a pink elephant. Like we right. just thought of a pink <laughs> elephant. I told you not to think of the pink elephant, but you know, this is just how your neurology is wired, which is fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Related to the manual work, and then we'll get into your book. Do you think you can make fascial changes by doing the hands-on work to people? I know you've got the one end of the spectrum. I won't mention their initials, but they're convinced you can definitely change fascia and you've got the other end of the spectrum that's, no, it's so hard. It's so dense. You're not making any changes. I can say from my experience, when I've done hands-on work on people, I can 100% feel tissue change. But my bias is I think I'm interacting with the nervous system in a live human that's causing a tonus change. I don't know how much, quote unquote, structural change I'm making. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. And I oftentimes will defer things like that to Dr. Robert Schleip, who, you know, yes. as many of us know in this whole field, has become somebody came out of the manual world 
movement. She mm -hmm. was deep into all of all ends of things and then went back and became a deep researcher. So he could also look at these sorts of things. And I do think what you're saying too is accurate. A lot of it may be more nervous system going on, more neurological response. Even our classic thing of rolling the ball underneath the foot to affect a change through the back of the body and Tom will say this himself, maybe more of a neurological response than purely really changing fascial tissue right there in that moment. However, all of that can have effect. You move something, you do it, you know that response is going to get you to forward bend easier, whatever, you start to have a pattern that may start to change, which may start to change tissue. Now, really, getting into the nitty gritty with science, I really find Dr. Vaughn's work fascinating most because of what she's done, looking both manual, but also through movement. She does a lot with looking at acupuncture needles. And that fascinates me if it's done well, because again, you're taking tiny needle into tissue, you're spinning that and you're creating tension into that fascial tissue, which does seem to have a response and change. Hmm. So I find her work fascinating as well as she, of course, did um, basically the mice holding on to the edge of the table, which elicits an up dog or lifting upwards position, <laughs> which actually had an effect on mice that had breast cancer cell in them. So that shift and change could happen too over time. Again, our mechanism, why we're changing, what we're changing all the time, isn't absolutely clear. There is a lot of manual work where somebody says right away, yeah, I'm feeling the fascia. But like you said, I think sometimes we're feeling more of a response system change that could have an effect. In yoga, we talk about samskaras, which are these patterns that hiccup people, mental as well as physical. If I have a pebble in my river and it's a small pebble, it's not going to make that much of a current around it. If I have a big pebble, I'm going to feel that my kayak as I'm going around, and that's going to have some pull and effect because it's a strong pattern. So same thing in the body and fascial tissue, you know, what we unwind, we know we can affect changes, but what we're actually doing when is still iffy on some of the science. So I think that's where, I mean, in my book and anybody's stuff as well, I'm still clear on Anybody who tells you they know everything about fascia, be careful. No. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. And I, I just went through a book on this and it's changing. Our science and understanding are changing because it's still relatively new to, again, focus our eye on it and what we can think about and what we can see. Does collagen ingesting it make a difference nutritionally for the athlete? We're looking at research but it's still, there's still a lot of unknowns of how and when that would synthesize and what that effect has on the fascial system. I have, again, curiosity around a lot of these things, but not the absolute answer. But if I get manual work done for me and it makes me feel better, it makes my body rest for an hour that I wouldn't have or do whatever, whether it's, again, myofascial fascial muscle really being worked on. Some of where I do see some of the effects and changes the most clearly in my own body system is, okay, those intramuscular septums are having more ability to slide and glide. And sometimes we might be affecting things like that the quickest. And, you know, like I said, I am not, I'm not a manual therapist, but I find all of this work and obviously our top athletes are looking all the time. What helps me the most performance level wise are recreational people. Everybody is looking for that. And in some ways too, are we also, is it effect of touch? We're mm -hmm. so touch starved too. You yes. know, there was that book that came out a couple decades back called touch. And there was, I mean, studies of, again, if a waitress touched your shoulder, they would likely get a better tip because there was some, appropriate human interaction. And now we live, like I said, in times, 
it's been hard to touch and yeah. touch loved ones and we're touch starved in a lot of ways or afraid of is this going to be inappropriate touch or is this whatever have you but as humans we need crave appropriate touch so you mean some of that in itself may be affecting our system just by nature that's why it's so Fascia is in interesting because it's intertwined so much into so many different areas of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the fascial planes. That's the only area, again, this is my biased guess. I don't know for sure. Is that I think you might be able to make them slide a little bit better, but beyond that, in terms of the pure hardcore mechanics route of mm -hmm. changing it, I have my doubts, but Again, it's one of those areas where I think it's you're going to be pretty hard pressed to say either way. And it's something that's hard to look at because I also know I'm biased working on fresh tissue cadavers where I've tried to manipulate some of the fascial structures or tear the IT band and things like that yeah. from a pure mechanical standpoint. It's ridiculously hard in <laughs> relatively deconditioned people too. So I, right. I know that kind of pushes my bias in that direction too and agrees with it so uh, and for me as well nothing works without something else if you don't put the movement into that you could keep going back to the same massage therapist over and over or structural integrator yep. or whoever and that's why a lot of those systems do have a level of movement education in it but if you don't take that and do something with it then you're just asking somebody to fix you like a car and we're not yep. that you gotta put the movement into it you gotta do and you gotta do some of that yourself that's where like i said i'll go back to that analogy of me being a trail guide i can lead people i can suggest things but i'm not picking them up and putting them on my back and walking them there they've got to do that work of whatever level that means to them. It's not that I am doing the route for them. They have to, I just, like I said, I have some more maybe experience in certain areas. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I think of it too. I do some hands-on stuff through RPR, primarily be activated therapy, which is Doug Heal's stuff. Yeah. And my whole goal is if I'm doing hands-on work on someone is to get them to a different place as fast and safely as I can so they can experience what it's like to move better, have less pain, whatever it is, and then pass that responsibility back to them. Okay, here's the drills we did. Yep. Here's the area yep. we worked on. You can work on these areas yourself. Here's a video. Here's how to do it. So I'm trying to get them to a different place so that they can experience it. But like you said, it's 100% on them that now they have to do the work in order to keep it. You probably have to change your movement practice. There's other stuff that, that goes yeah. into that also. And for me, that also makes the screening easy because my <laughs> wife will screen people and she's like, oh, did you do any of your drills? And if they're like, no, they're like, she won't rebook any sessions for anybody. <laughs> because yeah. I'm like, if you don't want to do the work, that's fine. I, my personality, I can't handle that. So I just choose not to work with those people. Someone else can work with you. That's totally fine. It doesn't bother me. Because I know I get frustrated that I'm doing the same thing over and over again. And I just don't want to do it. So I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally hear you on that. And I've had sometimes too, somebody who's like, oh, I wish my spouse, my partner, whoever would do this. I keep telling them how important it is. And I want them to have a session with you. And I'm like, I'm fine to wait I'm, when yeah. they want to do it, then they come to me when they're ready to go. I'm there for them, but I'm, I'm very clear. I'm not dragging you along. I want you to do some work here. And I have curiosity. You have curiosity. Then we're like, whoa, there's a lot we can do and accomplish. But if you're expecting me to fix you. Yeah. Nope. And I don't have all the answers. And I'll be really honest when I also go, yeah, this is outside of where I can go with this in my own wheelhouse. And that, that's important to own too. I think a lot of time practitioners are like, I can do it all. Then you're not being honest either about either the work or yourself, I think in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one mistake I would tell myself if I were to go back and start personal training and fitness stuff again is 
other than education, which is great and learn by doing awesome, but just have a really good referral network. And if you don't have yeah, one, borrow somebody definitely. else's. Just, hey, man, I need a good physical therapist or I need a good exactly. hands-on person, exactly. movement therapist, like psychologist. Like it's not mm -hmm. that hard to do. And it, it just saves you so much time and effort. And then no, just ask them and say, hey, what things should I listen for to know that they need to see you? And they yeah. usually just yeah. tell you what they are. And then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, that would have just made my life so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so words of advice out there to your listeners. Yeah. That he's in that position. <laughs> yeah. And last question, I want you to tell us all about your book. Do you think fascia can hold memories and emotions? That's a loaded question. I, I know, know that's pretty woo-woo woo out there. The but... And all of that. In my book, I do show, I worked shortly after 9-11 mm. with a lot of people and this mm -hmm. was the body position. We're not tea leaf reading. Everybody who's like this isn't right. depressed for that, but there's a curiosity too in going, I mean, if physically I'm put into this position over time, I may feel not yeah, so great because it totally. also correlates to that depressed state. So yes and no, I think we're much more complicated than we can exactly no. This was my initial, this was my master's degree work and my licensing, and I'm still licensed as a dance movement therapist. We have full master's degree, 4,000 hours post-graduation before wow. we're allowed to as work before we're allowed to do individual sessions. It's a lot of work in looking at people and also having a conversation and movement with that person. So where, like I said, if I do see somebody in this way, again, I'm not going to immediately go, let's go right. for the full whatever. It is feeling that having what we call in the field kinesthetic empathy. Hmm. This came out of um, like that. a thinker, Miriam Berger, who was the first to coin that phrase. I love it. It's mm, so I spot like that. on. I'm going to steal if that. I have kinesthetic <laughs> empathy and I can try that on and see how that feels or guess where humans having a human experience I mean though each of us will have different reactions to all of it but in that work it's guessing where that may be and if somebody's been in a body position for a while because of stress or trauma or other things it does in some ways get written into their patterns patterns matter also alongside neurology it gets all intertwined because of that nervous system being so close to the fascial system i think a lot of times too there is a relationship whether or not it's as straightforward as sometimes it looks out there in mm -hmm. pop culture hey just release this and your everything's stored in your hip and once you get that open you'll be yeah. fine not so easy to just make those one-on-ones, but there is starting to be more research coming out. Robert Schleip was part of this too, that was looking at depression and a fascial tissue and how that responsiveness of the elasticity in the tissue changed in depressed patients. Hmm. So there's early research starting to come out, but there hasn't been a lot. So a lot of it is again, what we observe, what we can make guesses on. So I think that's where I go with all of that as well. There's a guy too, Calcius, who also seem, has put together a lot of this deep, similar to Tom's deep front line, <laughs> pardon me, deep work in the body system and its relationship to psychological core as well. So I think some of these things are interesting where we go from them will be interesting to see as well. But there's some early connections. I don't think it's all as straightforward as we like it to be. We're a little more complicated than that. But like I said, if people are looking for some of the latest research, Robert Schleip is on top of some of that as well. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, my quick two cents is, I don't think it's necessarily stored in the tissue per se, but like you said, I think it's stored as a nervous system response. Yeah. Right? And if you take the opinion that, your body is very much survival based and some very bad traumatic thing happened, car accident, eye position, hit in the head, whatever it is. What I've noticed with movement patterns is their body will not want to go back to that exact position because if you're survival based, 
your body's thinking, hey, the last time we we're here, some really bad shit happened. So for God's sake, let's not go back to that position again. So I guess I kind of view, and this is from Doug Hale's stuff too, that it's more of a full body response and fascia is definitely a part of that. And you can definitely see different holding up positions and you can see the reverse. I think it's a two-way street. Like we've definitely done some work on people where I didn't even, the stuff that happened to him that I have, I don't want to know about, I didn't ask them about, I'm not a psychologist, but things would just happen and they would remember certain things when I noticed they wouldn't want to go into a certain position. You asked for their permission, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So it's pretty fascinating how, again, your body is very survival orientated. And to your point too, do you really want to know? Maybe there's some doors you just don't want to open. You're not prepared to go into. Cause I think there's the other thing mm-hmm. with social media of everything of everyone's been traumatized. You need to deal with all your trauma. You need to go find it. And I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Like, sometimes you have to then be it willing puts... to do the work. Oh. <laughs> and handle the repercussions of what may happen because you don't know. So, Yeah, I think that's a really important point and something I'm seeing too shift and change. I mean, with the students that I work with on a regular basis too in, in my long years in all of this, but sometimes it isn't useful to, <laughs> to dissect. <laughs> I like dissection, but to dissect yeah. every single part of things because also human memory is not accurate a lot. Correct. But we do have what I did find post 9-11 is trauma sometimes stirs up traumatic feelings, whether or not we know exactly why. At that time, very first person I ever saw was a Holocaust survivor, population mm. I worked with. And when 9-11 happened, her nightmares started recurring, pulling back that Mm. time. So some of it was to get the body into a sense of safety, reframing it, not going back there to everything. That was traumatic. I knew she was, she happened to be Hungarian. I had done a lot of folk dance. I used actually very traditional dance in this case. And we did what's called a Hungarian chardash, very simple Hmm side to side movement dance that brought her back in some ways to that time period, but was a comforting level Mm -hmm. reframing for it. And it makes it a little bit easier to then move onwards. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Brené Brown, who has Mm -hmm. Liz of the Heart, who is out there in pop culture. I did find this interesting that she was doing a study of people who could only really name three emotions. It was like, happy, sad, and pissed off. And then a lot of these other subtleties of jealousy or other things were much more difficult to name. And if Hmm. you can't pinpoint these things or name them, it's sometimes hard to let that go in Mm, some ways too. That was an interesting way to look at it too. But yeah, all of this with the fascial tissues, we've got to be careful. And also I kind of warn people to be careful of overstepping where their knowledge is. We want oh, yeah. to help. That's good. We know certain things are therapeutic in themselves. That's good. But not every thing is therapy or is. So we got to be a little bit careful of how we dance around this. And like I said, the research is incredibly sparse. But coming out there, just to be careful a little bit as a caveat, I do think a lot of this is connected, but how, that's where we're exploring. Yeah, that's where we're exploring. Yeah, yep. I like the, I took the trauma course from Tom Myers and the big takeaway I got from it too, is super useful is that he's just pretend you're a good neighbor. Is Sometimes people <laughs> may want to tell you about what happened. Sometimes they don't. Your job is not to solve it. Your job is just to be there, be compassionate. And just listen. And, and, and realistically, that's what I find actually works the best too. It's just like the person just wants to make sure they're safe. Some people want to tell you about it. Some people don't. doesn't matter to me. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not trying to analyze anything. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, the person will know what they need to do and they'll be okay. So I thought that was good advice. Yeah, it's coming back to having a conversation, whether it's verbally or non-verbally. When we're talking bodies, we just, we want to, if we're doing things well, we're in conversation. A lot of the world right now, 
doesn't have conversation. They have opinions. <laughs> and we're yes. seeing this even in the fitness and movement world. You're so stuck to one thing that we can't hear somebody else's opinion or thought process. I think that's really something to be open to. Yep. Awesome. So tell us about your book. I have it right here. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. And I actually have another one I contributed to. Oh, I contributed cool. Super to cool. an anatomy coloring book. They both arrived on my doorstep the exact same day. My preview oh, copies. Nice. It was a little bit strange and eerie, but this is this one's mine, the myofascial system and movement. And I say it's mine, but it's mine along with a lot of contributors. I decided I could quote people, and I do quote a lot of people in this book. But I also, instead of rephrasing somebody else's thought process, I said, James Earls, who does Born to Walk in the football, mm -hmm. come give me a couple little thought boxes from you or Michelle Delcour. Oh, nice. You know, yeah, Chris Frederick from Stretch to Win or all of these other people. Some of these names you will have heard of. Some of them are new to some people too, but a mix of both sometimes little movement snippets or thought snippets in there too. So the whole book, part of it is, like I said, I like conversation. I like thinking about ideas and putting it out there. It's exploring through some of these common things, getting a little bit more of a handle on some of the technical terms as we know them right now, but also to open up some ideas into how you can explore and play with all of this book what i do love is really visually rich i have i have oh, nice. friends of mine from i Body love World. pretty pictures we have <laughs> the dissection i worked on freya oh, is in there. Awesome. we have all different things we have some of the historical pictures too so we oh, even nice. have yeah, we even have that bougery from Bougerie and Jacobs. We have cellular, extracellular oh, matrix, yeah. which is something I worked on. We yeah, had my models. kidney in there, but this is cactus extracellular huh. matrix. Wow. Um, just to show and think about it. My hope is somebody is flipping through and has a curiosity when they stop on a picture and go, oh, what's this all about? Here's that picture after Bartinioff of oh, the diaphragm and so huh, as. Nice. Here's a Persian older anatomy textbook of thinking about core in different mm. ways. I hope it gets people's juices going to sometimes then go off and explore with other people. I think it's most fun when you do that in life and in the world. Yeah. And I, like I said, I packed a lot of images in there. Not as hardcore as some of the anatomy, but I do have some of my dissections in there as far as that. But I wanted also people like Mike Jacobs, who's a golfer to have showing golf swing in there or other things so it's like i said a uh, a book to to have out maybe to have your juices getting sparked or to leave out for a client and have them flip through and have a conversation if they land on something that's interesting to them it's right now it was officially supposed to come out it's out in england oh, but okay. they had a shipping delay maybe by the time the podcast oh, yeah. is out it will be back it had been available for pre-order on amazon it will come back at some point but our publisher handspring is also under singing dragon Hmm. We'll give you, we'll give your listeners all the info and all the details. Yeah, we'll definitely link to it. And Amazon yeah. probably the best place to get it then. Is that correct? Amazon will be. The, right now, they're only doing third party people again, but it okay. will come back to being able to pre order or directly from Handspring or Singing Dragon. They'll okay. be getting more copies in. If you have listeners in the UK, they can get a copy right, right now. Oh, so perfect. Yeah. Awesome. And where can people find out more about wellnessbridge.com, www.wellnessbridge.com. That's got pointers to all different things. I'll have up more information soon about my upcoming dissections. KNMlabs.com is the trio that I'm working with for those, but I'm also coming up, like I said, we I have a new one I'm going to announce soon, yes. for especially sports people and mm. coaches. That's going to be East Coast, a little bit further south for me. But once we have all the details locked down, I will share that with you and you can yeah, share with your sure. readers because that will be specifically focused for some of the sports and training people. So I'm excited about that one too. But yeah, wellnessbridge.com, 
Facebook, Lori Nemitz. <laughs> You'll have it spelled out. Instagram. Sadly, now I have three. I'll give you all three. Oh, wow. Yeah. You have in the notes, <laughs> but I have Wellness Bridge. I have one Anatomy Bridge, which has a lot of historical artwork. And soon we'll be having my upcoming trip in Italy about art and dissection. And then the myofascial system, too, so that I have stuff just dedicated to the book and some of my featured authors and guests and all those good things. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, we'll definitely link to all that for sure. And I would highly encourage everyone to check it out. I'm sure the book looks amazing. And books like that are just a really good snapshot if people are interested for the price. It's definitely well worth the time, even just to flip through and just read sections that grab your interest. I think it's a good, definitely a good yeah. starting place for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I wanted it to do is just so you get your attention pulled somewhere, go explore some more. That's, I think, what's so important. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for all your time today. And I thank you for all your help in the labs. And I've learned a ton of stuff you from you in the past and hopefully to learn more from you again in the future. Really appreciate Great. it. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me in and your time. And it's always nice to bump into you and both the lab. We bumped into each other in the experimental That's right. in the past. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. And hopefully we'll get to see each other in person again sometime soon. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to all your listeners too. And feel free to ask me more. I'm readily available on a lot of these platforms too to interact with. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs> thanks. Take care. Huge thanks to Lori for coming on the podcast today. Always great to chat with her and always also a wealth of information about the fascial system and just movement in general. I would highly recommend you check out her book, which should be out by the time you listen to this podcast. As I said, it's uh, brand new. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but I'm sure it's going to be great. Some of the preview images I've seen, it really appears to be well done. And if Lori is doing it, I'm sure it's going to be just great. So if you're interested in movement in the fascial system, I would highly recommend you check that out. I'm definitely going to pick up a copy for sure. Uh, so again, thanks to Lori. You can check out all of her information and websites and always busy doing something related to fascia there. And thanks again for listening to the podcast. Always appreciate it. If you want to hear more from me, you can go to MikeTNelson.com and get on to the newsletter there. That's where most of my content uh, goes out. If you want to hit reply and tell me who you'd like to see on the podcast or anything else I can do to help you out. Now, speaking of helping us out, if you could leave us whatever stars you feel is appropriate and even just a short couple sentence review. That really uh, helps us out, especially with distribution of the podcast. Thank you so much for all of your time and uh, listening all the way to the end. If you find someone who may enjoy this, uh, feel free to send it over to them. Thank you so much, and we will talk to you again next week. I have a good mind to go home. You had a good mind, you wouldn't be here in the first place. <laughs>